Wax, or The Discovery of Television Among the Bees, is a 1991 avant-garde film directed by David Blair that made history by being the first feature film uploaded to the internet. Wax combines state-of-the-art digital animation with live-action stage direction and archive footage. Expressed through hyperreal dissonance, this unique mode of communication serves to critique the United States government and military-industrial complex, as well as the tools and technology that they create for warfare. Blair serves as the unreliable narrator and talks in cryptic riddles as his on-screen character, Jacob Maker, descends into madness, unable to navigate reality and make coherent sense of the world around him, especially with respect to his involvement in ending lives overseas. My name is Jacob Maker. Hive Maker was my grandfather. I inherited my bees from him. I didn't keep them for the honey. I just like to watch them. Wax provides fresh commentary on the Persian Gulf War, and by employing unconventional means of storytelling, it fittingly abandons and protests the established order, both inside and outside the text. Over the last three decades, the film has become something of a cult film, and its niche fan base continues to grow. Wax is a film to be experienced first and analyzed second, although simply watching the film could be a daunting task, for the nonlinear narrative and stream of consciousness narration are at times incomprehensible, and finding a true literal meaning can lead to dead ends. For these reasons, I will posit that we should assume Mako's narration is not to be trusted or taken literally, and meaning can instead be found between the lines. This is Style of Substance. In early 1914, a spiritualist cinematographer from the Supernormal Picture Society of London joined the Royal Expedition to the Antarctic. His name was James Maker. He was also known as Hivemaker. James Hivemaker hoped to photograph evidence of life after death. Jacob Maker's narration walks us through his rather peculiar family tree, and he displays a certain affinity towards his grandfather, James Hivemaker who supposedly believed to have captured the spirits of the dead on film during the 1910s. This general time period marked two narratively relevant advances in culture, one being that cinema would soon be revolutionized by filmmakers like D.W. Griffith, and the other being World War II. Hivemaker traveled to the ends of the earth to affirm his faith in the afterlife, and then also to document it on film. While indeed a spiritual endeavor, this also demonstrates humankind's obsession with the potential of technology. In this case, it's the camera, to not only preserve lost histories, but also play God, and step outside the boundaries of natural human communication and understanding. Maker's temporal reference points are marked by violence, but in this case of his grandfather's fascination with the dead, it is a sort of unviolence, a remanufacturing of human souls, all while millions of people were dying left and right over the next few years by the Great War and the Spanish Influenza. In a sense, 1915 saw D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, cementing cinema's innate connection to real-world violence, as it not only reconstructed the dead and preserved their legacy on film, but also achieved reconstruction and preservation of the fallacious image of the South that in turn is argued to have contributed to the inciting of real-world violence on black Americans during the return of the Ku Klux Klan. The camera, like other technology, was co-opted by national governments to be transformed into a tool of propaganda throughout the Second World War. Look no further than the films by Leni Riefenstahl, like The Triumph of the Will or Olympia. And as technology advanced, so too did the weapons that they gave birth to. And in the 1940s, the nuclear bomb was created. And throughout the Vietnam War, in the 1950s through 70s, cinema's sister, the television, was also rendered a weapon, and a means at promoting nationalistic propaganda that simultaneously glorified atrocities, all while degrading human bodies. The television became instrumental during the short-lived Persian Gulf War, as live news broadcasts took place by CNN, 
at the front lines of the battle. Fittingly, Blair uses television as a motif throughout the course of Wax, as Jacob Maker becomes increasingly disillusioned by this one-way form of technological communication, as he believes the bees he keeps are creating their own sort of television, perhaps making the implicit parallels between the sounds of television static and the buzzing of the honeybees. Although it's also important to recognize that television static occurs when there is either a bad connection or no connection at all. Therefore, the television in this context is framed as a source of miscommunication. But with the television on, Jacob feels he is, as he has always been, instructed to do something. And if it's not direct, it's indirect. The man is fascinated with symbology and finding meaning between the lines, where there is likely nothing actually possessed. The bees are communicating amongst each other, but in Jacob's mind, he believes they are speaking to him. They spoke to me as bees. They showed me a line that I would have to follow through the darkness. Jacob Maker works for the United States government on weapon simulators. But just as his line of work engages with hyperreality, he too enters his own form of simulation and is unable to navigate between the real and the artificial. My walks became longer. I often found myself 15 or 20 miles downrange, still full of energy. So of course he believes his honeybees speak to him, that there are voices within the hive. And depending on how you look at it, Jacob descends into madness or cracks the code, causing him to transcend the boundaries of his own existence within space and time, and travels back to his moment of birth. I was born on July 16th, 1945, in the house of my dead grandfather, a place known as the Garden of Eden, near Abilene, Kansas. Furthermore, Jacob begins encountering souls within the very weapon system that he creates at work. And as he pursues new forms of communication, the bees supposedly place a crystal inside his head, granting him access to a new mode of television. The bees were waiting for me. They pierced the side of my head. Through this hole they inserted a mirrored crystal. I had discovered television among the bees. According to Jacob Maker, the bees serve as conduits for the souls of the dead to speak with him and lead him to transcend even more into enlightenment. And he experiences the past incarnations of his soul and unlocks the secrets of the universe and his place within it. To hit a simulated target was to secretly prepare murder against the real target. Eventually there would be real ghosts. I had to decide now. I was on a mission. I turned off the radar and headed towards the moon. The bees are made up of the fragments of dead souls. That is their ultimate reincarnated form. The essence of bees is death. They die from reproduction. They die from self-defense. Their life consists of suffering and constant work. They work to save and protect the earth and to give people luxury goods. They are the meek. And because they are the meek, they will never actually inherit the earth, no matter what promises are fed to them. Pentagons change to hexagons, and the U.S. military changes to the meek constantly. It's just unnoticeable to most. An evolutionary strategy honeybees often adopt is sacrificing their lives for the benefit of their relative survival. And when a honeybee stings, it is a gruesome death. In some ways, the kinship of bees is comparable to human social behavior and the apparent collectivist goals of militaries. 
and the bees can be thought of as soldiers, among many other things. The patriotic and propagandic notion that many soldiers think is that they are fighting for the protection of their family, of their home, and of their country. And while this can indeed be true in some cases, this isn't necessarily true in all cases. In fact, in many times, what soldiers are ultimately sacrificing their lives for is just national profit gain and the extraction of resources like oil overseas. The fact that the honeybees in the film are a special breed imported from Mesopotamia draws parallels to the ways people on both sides of international conflicts in the Middle East and Muslim-majority African countries are exploited. Such soldiers act as pawns in an elaborate game of chess by higher-ups, looking to achieve power and fill their pockets, until eventually exhausting their resources and destroying the environment around them. The bees work together and create honey, only for that honey to be extracted by people. A beekeeper controls their bees for personal gain, just as leaders control and exploit their own people for their own gain. Honey bees are not aggressive and only really sting when provoked. Stings can be painful and dangerous to those who develop allergic reactions to the venom, but for most people, a single bee sting poses very little threat. Likewise, attempts by the people to rise up and overthrow their leaders are so often easily ended by those in power, and it ultimately leads to those provoked dying in their efforts of self-defense. People like bees are controlled, and people like bees are generally passive and make relative peace with their surroundings, even if they are controlled. Soldiers like bees often surrender individual interest to act collectively, carrying out goals that they are naturally and socially wired to carry out. Not that I or the film even condemns beekeeping by any means, but the metaphor for controlling a little army of sorts is certainly there. The relationship between beekeeper and bee is also comparable to the relationship between God and man, and by that I mean it goes both ways. The bees can be seen as the controlled, or the controller, the secret architects behind everything. It can also be both at once. The day after my strange experience at the hive, a thought came to me in the middle of an explosion. I remembered another strange experience with the bees. The fact that Jacob's spiritual connection to the bees is in part triggered by the developing of code for targeting in a simulation is of no coincidence. In many ways, Jacob struggles to accept his complicity in a system that regularly commits international atrocities and transforms humans into machines. I was assigned to military systems where we built weapon systems trainers, making sure that everything was as real as possible. And as he constructs a simulated reality, Jacob also loses touch with the reality around him. He rationalizes the guilt that he possesses for his contributions to the military, arguing that he is just following orders, or that something higher and divine is leading him to carry out these actions. It should be of no surprise that many national leaders use religious politics as a means to promote support and justify engaging in war even though war is oftentimes actually antithetical to the very religious belief systems. Jacob, too, becomes militarized, and becomes part of the hive mind that is the military-industrial complex, visually represented by that crystal placed in his head. And as Jacob loses connection to his original reality, the film's image itself breaks, unfolds, twists and turns into new shapes and sizes. Jacob also becomes obsessed with symbology and conspiratorial thinking, just as someone wishing to pick apart this film might find themselves becoming. I wanted to take a picture. But all I could do was dance. That's when the bees arrived, riding on broken fragments of time. The contentious beliefs of conspiracy theorists often stem from an incongruity within the relationship between their self and their trust in existing power structures, while ironically enough, it often also comes from 
the refusal to let go of their blind, sometimes passive allegiance to the very inner workings of these same very structures. Other times, conspiracy theorists are just naively exploited by a harmful rabbit hole of misinformation that grants the individual a level of comfort or further disillusioned panic for supposedly knowing better than anyone else. Many of these conspiracies also bring to mind existing systems of fascism, the film's fascination with objects, iconography, propaganda, and esoteric relaying of information and religion all have similarities to theories utilized primarily by the Nazis in World War II. But these were also commodified and exported to other countries and cultures as well. That's not to say there aren't many true conspiracies or odd social phenomena. There are, and there are many. But the mindset of a deep conspiracy theorist is often a troubled one. This is expressed in the film, and the enlightenment that Jacob faces is in many ways a compromise between slavery to the military and the preservation of an individually defined identity as his own person. I had reached the land of the dead. I relaxed for a few moments. Then I was ready. I knew which way to go. Into the darkness. He wants to be special after all, as many people do, and must rationalize potential complacency in sinning against his fellow man by reframing his existential journey as something of a holy mission to enlightenment. I'm sure some connections can also be made to terrorist appropriating religions like Islam to justify their atrocities. The first thing I noticed was the light. This also explains many of the biblical references within the film. Jacob refers to the bees as fractured spirits of the dead, and he will receive a new body after he kills. This is where he discovers the Garden of Eden Cave, an anagram for vengeance for the dead. He told me that these bees had come to Basra through a cave that led to the center of the earth, where there was a planet that someday I would visit. In Genesis, the first people lived within the Garden of Eden, but after giving into temptation and disobeying God's orders, the first sinners, Adam and Eve, were exiled from the garden, now with the knowledge of good and evil. Later on in life, their son Cain killed his brother Abel with a stone. Once Abel's blood spilled upon the earth, the earth refused to serve man, which led to the rise of civilization as we know it today. Cain was cursed to walk the lands, isolated from his family, and was given the mark of Cain in X shape, which granted him divine protection from premature death. When I was a child, Cain killed his brother Abel. After that, God put an X mark on Cain's forehead in order to protect him from vengeance. Whoever killed Cain would die 13 times. The mark of Cain is interpreted to be many things, such as an omen or a sign to others to not commit murder against one's fellow brother. Take brother in a familial sense or in a broader sense. Religious myths are certainly peculiar and ripe for textual analysis. The question many will ask is, why is it that even in Cain's curse, he must be protected by God from vengeance for the death of his fellow brother? Wax makes reference to this story in its questions. Why must God protect Cain? Who will carry out vengeance for the dead? It was up to me to kill someone. That was where I had to go. The X-shaped gun sight floated before my eyes. I was Cain. That was my mark. God would protect me from my victims. Even in the name of war, 
killing a fellow brother, separated only by national origin, is still putting an end to a brother's life. And for what? A medal? Glory? If it's glory, it's glory through government-approved murder. The U.S. military effectively kills its own people, too, putting soldiers in battle, exploiting their bodies the moment that they graduate high school, and setting them up to be brainwashed, hurt, or killed, all for the nation's games of sickness and greed. It's not God in the end. The idea of God is exploited, effectively dead to society, and in their place, it is a corpse, puppeteered like a marionette doll by the billionaire ventriloquist. It's not God's will for a man to kill, but even if it were, would that make it right? What does it profit a nation to drone strike a family's home? And what does it profit a man to put a bullet into an Arab child's skull? The dead had attacked me. Now I would attack them. I was protected. They wanted me dead, but I was going to kill them before they killed me. It is humankind's secularized and, ironically enough, religious goal now to be God, to decide who deserves to live or die, to determine who should be avenged for their death, who has the right to rule a land, and who has the right to defend themselves. Propaganda is taken as truth, and even still, the innate human disgust at perceived moral wrongs prevail, until the individual, or the forces controlling the individual, crushes these very natural human traits. And as men build their towers to reach, overthrow, and become a god, their plans are quickly ended. But if not by God himself, then by nature or by his own fellow man. The Tower of Babel was there, and the bees lived inside it. In Genesis, the Tower of Babel was constructed to reach God. God responded by cursing everybody to speak multiple different languages, which ceased development of the Tower. This effectively killed the language of Cain rendering it the language of the dead. What we can see with the civilizations that follow the death of Abel is that they were built upon the foundations of the death of a brother, or the death of many brothers. Furthermore, slave labor is ostensibly death in itself. It's death built upon death, and vengeance for the dead is the world's conquest against conquest. History is written by the victors, but more importantly, it is written for the victors. The language of Cain is appropriated by those impacted by him, and by this I am referring to the dead, the meek. Some see the dead as an oppressive, domineering, ruthless force, but what is more ruthless than the living? The meek do not inherit the earth, but instead they inherit the mark of Cain, his name, his X-shape. It was time for me to find out who I was going to kill. Time ran forwards and backwards. I emerged in a room as bright as noon covered with magnificent honeycomb. Hidden behind those walls, the bees were hard at work sculpting enormous wax figurines, feminine forms in which they intended to enter our world. Jacob is reincarnated several times over including as the X-shaped Siamese twins. On the top is Jacob Maker, and Zoltan Abbasid, his wife's grandfather, whom he is also related to. We're all attached. That's me, Jacob Maker, and next to me is me, Zoltan Abbasid. We're on top. 
On the bottom are the two Iraqis we murdered in the tank. They're our brothers now. He has died as Avicid, and lived as Maker. He has died and he has lived. This reincarnation follows a killing. He has killed two Iraqi men, operating an army tank in the Gulf War. These are not his only identities, though, as he also is his grandfather, Hivemaker, and two women, and a genetic corn researcher, as well as the first nuclear weapon, Fat Boy. This points to an inherent unity and inseparability between a man and his family and the weapons the military constructs to destroy other families, in addition to a connection between people from all around the world and throughout time. People are ultimately connected to their world, sometimes in unexpected ways. Their jobs, for better or for worse, contribute to systems of oppression and greed. In the case of Jacob Maker, or whoever he is in the end, he is contributing to a war, and this impacts many people. His involvement isn't just indirect, it is direct too. He knows it, we all know it. The United States has lost more soldiers to suicide than to ISIS. Jean Baudrillard may say that the Gulf War did not take place, but one must wonder to what extent any war takes place, especially in the age of information and misinformation, technological progress, environmental decay, and society's continuous headfirst plunge into simulations a complex socio-political matrix, if you will. There are hints throughout Wax at reconstruction, or reincarnation. Perhaps there is hope for this world, and if not, people must maintain a false hope in order to stay sane and progress as individuals and as collective groups. And when we die, we exist in another state of being, or so one would like to think, whether our souls end up existing in heaven or in hell, or within something else on the moon, in the center of the earth, building the Tower of Babel to the living gods, or somewhere elsewhere in this computer-generated universe. To paraphrase a friend, David Blair tries to tackle not the entirety of the human experience, but instead the entirety of human consciousness. But what is the core of human consciousness beyond love? I love my brothers, and I believe that. That's the power of love. Hello everybody, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I want to give a special shout out to Eric Reeds for providing original music and co-writing this video, and for recommending me this film in the first place. And special thanks to my patrons, Werner Saz, Claire, Devin O, Greg, Adam Young, Yaka Rajanoi, Sophie Pilbeam, Picadon, and Wolfgang. If you want to see your name included here, as well as unlock early access to videos and exclusive content, uh, please do consider donating to my Patreon. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, and share my work around. It really does help. And also, um, let me know what you thought of this video in the comment section below. Oh, and uh, David Blair, if you're watching this video, um, thank you for making this film, and do not hesitate to say hello. Um, uh, I guess that's it. Bye-bye.